you can get started. All right, thank you. Hey guys, welcome to Spilling the Tea series with uh, with us, CGC um, hosting it, uh, along with Will Henry, who um, is an Earlham grad. Uh, so guys, just before we get started, I do want to remind you that, um, you know, CGC has a lot of re really, really useful resources for you to guys to use on the website. Just go into the cgc.earlham.edu um, ed and you'll be able to see um, resources that we've recently added, as well as if you're still looking for uh, virtual experiences, you can go and check out virtual partner providers uh, and contact us if you have any questions. But uh, let me quickly introduce Will to you. Uh, just real quick, I will um, talk, tell you in a couple of sentences, you know, just um, give you like a Will's bio uh, really briefly. So uh, Will is an experienced startup leader and educator. He has over 1,500 hours as an experiential educator, is a Venture for America Fellowship recipient, and a student of Ken and Flagger Business School's year-long Startup UNC program. I definitely did not pronounce that correctly. Well, it's close. No, it's close. <laughs> Will founded the Young Founders Institute, uh, which is an early age education, any early age stage educational company that teaches entrepreneurship to middle and high school students. Um, he also founded Aspire Career Foundations, which participated in uh, North Carolina's Ideas Labs and launched Chapel Hill's Accelerator Program. Will is a graduate of Earlham College, where he studied biology. Uh, when Will is not teaching, his hobbies include salsa dancing, rock climbing, and studying to be an amateur economist. Yeah, so welcome, Will. Very nice having you today. Um, Will and I overlapped a little bit. I graduated in 2015 and you graduated in 2016, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. No, I actually came in, I think, with your class. So I came in 2011 and I took a year off after my freshman year. Yeah. And like went around the country and kind of got to know, uh, kind of, yeah, like had some new experiences. And then I came back and that's why I graduated a year later. So yeah. we came at the same time. But we're, yeah, I think we're age wise, we're the same age. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So Will, I'll be asking a couple of questions, um, you know, specifically just about you, really. They're all about you and your experience, but I wanted you to kind of elaborate a little bit more on your role, on your current role at the Young Founders Institute. Cool. Sounds great. Um, and can I like riff off that just also a little about my background, just so you all know like more who I am. Of course. I went through, so I was at, at Earlham, I studied biology and chemistry but I really like should have studied PAGS. Like that was like, in retrospect, I wish I would have studied PAGS, but there was, and there wasn't even like really an entrepreneurship program while I was there mm -hmm. or like in business. So that also sounds, we have a, we just hired an Earlham grad um, named Zoya. I don't know how many of you know Zoya, but Zoya sounds, she went through the entrepreneurship program and loved it and she's killer. She's an awesome addition to the team. Um, but when I was at Earlham, I lived in Foster House. Does anyone know Foster House? I lived in Foster House and I worked in like outdoor ed. So I worked, led August Wilderness and um, yeah, ran like the outdoors club as well as like um, took some classes with like Gypsy and Kevin Miles and I don't know, the crew. Those are like my, my like, uh, those are like my, really my favorite classes. I came in like on a pre-med track and like slowly deviated off that as I went through the Earlham. Um, but back to Anastasia's original question, like what is my role right now? So I'm like kind of part CEO, part entrepreneur um, at the Young Founders Institute. So my role as a CEO is, and as, it's kind of like a CEO executive director. It's like what that means, I think at a high level is just like someone who's a manager. So like I manage the team and make like strategic decisions for the organization. So it's like, um, that's the CEO component. So it's a lot of like me, like kind of trying to gather information kind of throughout my day is all about gathering information, listening a lot, um, then kind of like putting that information, trying to synthesize it in like business models, whether that's like a pro forma or like a cash flow analysis or um, just trying to like mapping those ideas and then kind of, uh, synthesizing that and then taking that back to the team and helping to create strategy at a high level. Um, and then there's also some of the CEO's duties that also really include like high level sales. So like um, sales and marketing, which is like just having conversations with partners, like, so like high value, like 
partners that we want to like attract or win over. That's kind of a CEO's duties. Um, and so that they kind of work those relationships and like, I have like my own like deal flow pipeline for um, those types of relationships. The other side, which is probably made more interesting to you all, um, the CEO part is cool. I think like CEO think part is like interesting. It's very managerial. Um, while though the entrepreneurship part is very, I think, kind of like exciting and cutting edge in a much more, in a different way. And the entrepreneurship part of my day or like my role is really geared around finding and creating value. Um, so there's a lot of it, it's really designed around like going through a process of going out and talking with customers, listening really effectively, um, understanding what their problems are and then designing solutions that I test in the market. So for example, um, tomorrow, I'm, we're partnering with some independent, like which are private schools and uh, high schools in the area. And we're, they have like some of these, they have some issues with their summer programs. And so we're looking at building like a tech solution to back their summer programs um, so they can scale them more readily and uh, have them grow margin wise so that they can make more profit from their summer programs. And so we like, I talk with them to understand what their problems are. And then I build, how many of you have heard of an MVP? Have you, have you ever come across the term MVP? What does it mean, Rance? What is it, what is it like you learned it as? What, how would you define it? Oh, you're muted. So it's like a minimum variable. It's like the simplest version of your uh, product, trying to get something that will just individuals that you can add more features to them in the future. Totally, exactly. It's like, I'm trying to capture what they've told me, they have a problem or a need, and I try to capture that need, like the essence of it in a product. And then I try to sell that product to them. So it's a minimum viable product. So it's like viable means that it like can live, right? Like it will live. Um, and so then I try to sell that to them as like, and when I, the proof of concept comes from the sale, right? Like where someone pays you for your ideas, that's when you know you're creating value. And so that's kind of like what my role is as an entrepreneur is to go through this process of like value creation. And it's very exciting because like, that is like kind of the key to like building value in the world. And like all entrepreneurs go through this process um, and uh, kind of being on that edge where you're creating value is just probably one of my favorite parts of the role. Um, nice, thank you so much. Uh, another question that is related to uh, the first one is in, how did you get involved in this field? How and why both of these are kind of like, you know, interrelated. Yeah, totally. Um, so how did I get involved in this field? So at a high level, when I graduated Earlham, I was like kind of swimming in like the world. I didn't really know which, it was like swimming in the ocean. I didn't know which direction to go. I could go like in a thousand different directions. It felt like, um, studying biology. I was like really, uh, I had like strong, like scientific background, but, uh, kind of a weak like directionality of like what I wanted to do. Like I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And I had, didn't really have like clear goals. Um, and so I ended up working at a lab and at the University of Chapel Hill. How many of you are, any of you science majors? Or you are, what are you studying, Alice? I am uh, planning to major in biochemistry. Biochemistry, exactly. So my background is biology and then I minored in chemistry. So I was working in cystic fibrosis research at UNC and through working at cystic fibrosis research, I then got plugged in with the business school um, because I could take classes for free at UNC. Um, and I then, so I was taking classes at the MBA school, which the MBA is like, I think it's like top 10, top 15 in the country. And it was really awesome because from there, I think I connected with like venture capitalists and like people that were um, entrepreneurs, um, all these folks that have like really like made these massive organizations and like have really changed the world and actually shaped. It's cool to like be around people that have like really shaping the way the world is flowing and kind of how, um, how the world is kind of developing. It's like, it's interesting to be around people that have so much kind of influence on that. And so from there, I got kind of tuned into entrepreneurship and got really excited about it. I was like, oh my gosh, this is lovely like I love doing this it's like it's really adventuresome like it's very you listen a lot there's a lot of empathy you have to build relationships and so from there um, I actually ended up leaving the lab like after 10 months and got a job with a company called Noom 
And that was just through a friend. It was like, I had made a friend. We were salsa dancing a lot together. And she worked for Noom, which is a company based out of New York. How many of you have heard of Noom? Noom Health? Yes, I've heard of it. Yeah? Mm-hmm. You might get ads. It's like a health and, or you might get ads. It's like a health and wellness app. Um, and what'd you say? Ebony is showing that she's also heard of it. Oh, you also heard of it, Ebony? Awesome. Yeah. So I was like the 34th employee at Noom. Um, and so they were like a small scrappy startup based out of New York. Um, and I was working remote and kind of flying back and forth to New York, which is really fun. Um, it was a great time, like to kind of get introduced to the startup scene. And from Noom, um, they've now like scaled. I think they raised like, I think 50 million two summer or two springs ago and are still, I don't know what their last investment round was, but they're like over a thousand people now. Mm-hmm. Um, and from there though, I, I got exposed to Noom and kind of like the startup culture um, and got really excited about like starting my own business. And then from there, I started a company called Aspire Career Foundation. So a business is really grounded in like, what's a problem in the world that you want to solve, right? Um, like it's less interesting, the product itself is less interesting, but the problem is like really fascinating, right? And if you can start, find a valuable problem, then you can build a business around it. And so I thought that a valuable problem would be helping recent college grads find jobs. Cause that's what I saw like all of my friends like struggling with. I was like, oh man. And like, it was, I was interviewing people like from Harvard grads all the way through um, like community college grads, like people across the board. It didn't matter where you went to school. It was just hard to find a job. And so what we started to do was like building like training around that and helping them like form networks and things like that very similar to what like a career services would do. Um, And so we were in that market. It was interesting. We were learning a lot. And kind of out of that, we started, all these parents were like, like parents would call us. They were like the primary customer was the parent where they'd buy it for their child. And the parent would call us and say like, hey, I want you to, uh, I don't really, like you could help my kid get an internship. Like that's totally cool. Like my recent college grad get an internship, but really I want you to help my high schooler get into a startup and intern at a startup while they're in high school. And I was like, that's kind of weird. Like start, that sounds kind of early, but over time we then launched um, a summer program to test that model. So we launched a summer program in 2019 to test that. And that was like an MVP. We spun it up in like four days and like immediately we launched like ran some marketing campaigns. And within a week we had, we'd made like, I don't know, $10,000 in revenue. Like it was pretty, it was like very quick turnaround because we'd hit that problem so well on the head. Um, and then from there, we've really just been iterating, trying to understand like what's beneath that. So we then launched, uh, we ran the summer program 2019 and we ran a summer program in uh, 2020. And that was kind of the process to get involved in the field. I guess the last other component of that is mentors were really essential to helping me get into that field. So through the Kenan Flagler, through the business school, I had a ton of mentors and I had like a lot of connections and a network here. And then network was essential to actually really getting into the field itself. Mm, Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, I think you've answered my my second, my follow-up question, my third one, which was (laughs) what are exciting things, trends happening in your field, but maybe if you want to elaborate a little bit more, what are some exciting things happening in your field? Um, You, you, you touched on, you know, the demand and how, how much of a, of a problem this really is for high school students to get engaged in entrepreneurship from the get-go and, you know, to really build up that passion and interest until they graduate high school and then potentially go to college and, and then, potentially they're joining a, um, a, a startup or starting their own startup, <laughs> really teaching them entrepreneurship skills. What are some other things that are exciting in your field that you're noticing through your work? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's interesting, our field, so my field is really like how to teach entrepreneurship. Mm-hmm. And like, so I don't know if you know the results on, have you all, have you ever heard of the results on like how many startups fail? Have you guys ever heard of those, those numbers? I think I think I definitely looked at a, at a like a different you know stats and data, but yeah. Have you guys? Anyone know that number? Like BB or Grace, do you guys know that number of how many startups fail? Seventy percent. How many do you think? Seventy percent. Anyone else? Ooh, that's scary. Ninety percent. Ninety percent. Getting closer. <laughs> yeah, it's like between ninety and ninety-five percent of startups fail. Um, so. And like, if they don't fail, they end up like 
So for example, when my, when my co-founders, he raised 7 million in venture capital, right? To fund his startup. But then the startup wasn't valued. At, like, I think when they sold it, it was valued at 5 million. So they raised more investment money than the actual value of the company. So it's like, there's all these, it's very challenging to actually create a valuable startup. So my field is really, I think like it, it's around like teaching entrepreneurship to teens is like how we express it, but it's really around like, what's the best method to build companies, right? And like, how do you most efficiently do that? And so my field is so something really interesting is that like, it's really cutting edge. Like the, the way people are building companies is really evolving quickly. Like since something called Lean Startup came out by a book called Eric, by Eric Ries, um, and I think it's like 20, 10 or 20 or 2009 um that really revolutionized the whole space him and a guy named um oh my gosh what's the other guy's name it'll come to me in a second but anyways they really revolutionized the space and so there's tons of new ideas that are really changing the whole like framework around how to build companies and that's i think like the cool piece of my field is that like people are figuring out how to do it more efficiently and how to build consistency into the process so that you can build a company by just following a process, right? Um, and very few industries have this problem, right? Most industries, like I think a lot of people when they talk about entrepreneurship, it's like, and then it magically happens. And like, that's not how it, like it's really, that's not how it works. It's like a process and like you learn each step of the process and then you execute those steps. Um, and so that's like what, what's really exciting thing in my field is that we're building this process and we're like on this cutting edge. So we're actually building our own process internally and then working with lots of people who are building their own processes. And like, we're at like kind of the forefront there. Um, and so that's what's really exciting to me is that we're, we're building like content and we're building methodologies that no one else has seen before or like, um, or has utilized. And that we're figuring out these new ways to create value in a market that um, just, no one's really done. And it's just, that's, I think, one of my favorite parts about our, our industry. Nice. Thank you so much for that. Well, I think this question will definitely be interesting, not just to me, but also to um, our students today. You know, you know, this, is a, this, is, this is one of those uh, areas that we focus on a lot at the CGCE, as well as, um, you know, there are lots of seminars, certifications, and so on, specifically talking about skills, transfer, transferable skills, what are the skills that are most that are trending, especially when it comes to, you know, what do employers look at the most? Could you elaborate a little bit more from your standpoint? What do you think are the kind of skills and um, characteristics that employers are looking for in future employees in your field? Or in my field. Maybe maybe in some general, in, in, in general, if, because of the kind of circle that you, um, surround yourself with and the kind of people that you've met so far maybe you can elaborate this both from your field as well as just generally what do you think uh, are the top skills and um, characteristics that would be just you know in the top few <laughs> that yeah. you're looking for yeah like, can i give a framework really quick for that i think that might be helpful to give a framework if you think about yourself how many of you have had internships thus far can you raise your hand if you had an internship? Okay, okay, cool. So Rance, Alice. I was so close to having one. And then so COVID close. Happened. <laughs> then COVID happened, totally. Well, when you were at that internship, like one of the things, if you're interning at, an org at a company or an organization, I think I would argue like every organization, but maybe some people would debate me on this. But one of the things like while you're interning there or when you're working, right, you are, a business you are like a business like a business is uh, something that creates value right you are a business within that business like your intern self is like you're a business within that business so your goal as the intern or the employee right is to, how do i create value for the organization that i'm working for right and like that whole framework i think is kind of radical like i think that is like a very um a lot of people, when they think about how to create that, they like, I just do the things they tell me and like, oh, my job sucks. <laughs> and like that, yeah, when you're just doing things that you, like you're being told, like that sucks because like you don't see like what's the actual impact that you're making. And like, as someone, if you're thinking of yourself though as a business within that business, right? Like my, as an employee, I am the business. 
you then oh, you then start uh, like thinking about how do I create value and value feels good. Like that's when we create value in the world, we feel it actually, there's like some kind of natural intrinsic like feedback loop that we get by creating value. So that that's like a high level thing. It's like you're creating value. So let's now like look at what are the highest value creating skills in the market today, right? And so if you think about those, um, I would argue that at least in my industry, there's two sides. One is someone who can um, provide the service or help facilitate the service being delivered to the customer. So that would look like sales, marketing, um, what else? Really those like the two sides of that, right? There's like this customer acquisition process is like sales and marketing. And then on the other side of that is, so that, that's one like kind of skill set is sales and marketing. And that's like, how do I influence people? How do I understand what their problems are so I can then build things to um, resonate that resonate with them? Like, how do I write copy, like marketing copy that looks like um, so what someone wants to read? So that's one side. The other side of it is like, how do I create products that are highly scalable. So that normally looks like tech, right? So someone who can write code or someone who can write a, build a service that is highly scalable. So that's like maybe a product manager or a developer or a software engineer. Um, and these are all like very attainable skills for all of us, even though maybe we didn't study them in undergrad there. It takes maybe like six months to learn how to be a, like a proficient developer. Um, but if you think about it from that perspective, it's like, how do I make something that can be repeatably executed over a lot, many different times, um, but doesn't cost a lot to keep on doing that. Um, and so those are kind of the two different skills that I would say are like most valuable. And like, I can then put myself into like, where do I fall in that? I fall, I'm like a little of both of those things. Like I'm kind of like a product manager to a certain degree. Like that's kind of what a CEO is as well as someone who does sales. So I like, that's like kind of what, those are the two sides of any business or organization. Um, there's a side of it that does sales and a side of it that's like a product manager side. Um, and so I fall on both of those um, tracks. I think that well, that's like when I was first looking at working in like, or working or trying to find a job, I didn't understand that relationship. I didn't understand how to like pitch myself into one of those things, the other. I think that was really challenging um, to then find a job because I thought like it was more just like things were happening, right? Without thinking about it from that value lens. Um, mm -hmm. Does that kind of answer that question? I don't know if that was, it was kind of vague, I think at the end, but. Yeah, yeah, no, I wanted, if you had to, if you had to choose three top skills that you would recommend, you would recommend, uh, you know, current Earlham students to focus on, what would they be? Oh man, I think, um, learning how to okay i would learn learn how to i learned sales i would like read a couple books on sales not how to win friends and influence people but i think that that's like that's a classic one i'd read a book called spin selling um which is about how do you find value for someone so sales i think is a really high level um skill i would learn a skill customer interviewing i think really customer interviewing is a methodology for um how do you figure out what's valuable to someone? It's asking the right questions to figure out what's valuable. It's customer interviewing. Um, yeah, I can definitely put those books in the chat. Um, spin selling, customer interviewing. And that would be like, you could read something called the, the mom test. It's like a classic customer interview book. It's like, the idea is that uh, your mom will always tell you that your idea is great, but you have to like ask the right questions to figure out if it's a good idea. I was like, that doesn't sound like my mom, but sounds interesting enough. Um, and so it's a great, that's a great book. Um, and then the last skill that I would really, I think just like understanding, um, I don't know. I don't even know what the third skill would be. Maybe it's like, like value, like thinking about um, like economics, like learning some like kind of basic principles of economics. Um, I don't even know that's a skill, but I think that like um, if you understand how economics works and kind of how to think like an economist, you can really make sense of what's happening in almost any position. 
Um, and people like employers and managers, they want people that think like an economist to work for them because that's how the market works. Um, and so there's a lot of people are really attracted to people in business, at least that think like ec economists. Um, so mm -hmm. I think those like would be the three skills I would really focus on. Thank you so much. This was very, very interesting. And I'm taking notes as well. Um, you know, next, uh, next uh, part, part that I want to kind of transition into would be more about, you know, life right after Earlham. <laughs> um, what was your first destination after you got your Earlham degree when you majored? What did you do first? Um, I was writing these in the chat really quick too, so that's helpful. Um, um, what did I do first? Okay, so when I graduated, I had like a crisis. I don't know if you guys have come across anybody who's had the same problem, but the when I graduated alum, I like I was dating a woman who lived in Miami, Florida, and I was like flying back and forth. Like my senior year, I was like flying back and forth to Miami from Indianapolis. She was like, a, she graduated the year before me as like a SOAN peg or SOAN, um, uh, SOAN major, and so. When I graduated, we broke up like the first that week. So we broke up. I graduated and we broke up later that week. And it was like, oh man, right? Like that was really intense. And at the same time, my parents were like going through a divorce, like at the same time. So like, everything in my world was like changing really radically. And I think that happens to a lot of people when they graduate is you're like, you, your community changes, your, um, like your social circle changes, like what are you gonna do next changes. Um, so that's totally natural if that happens to you too. Um, but I, after I graduated, I then a friend of mine worked, had a job in California. His like uncle was like building houses out in California. And I was like, I was so kind of like lost in that. And I just like tried to find some grounding. So I took that first job and worked in California for a couple of months building houses. It was very not fun. And then I moved to, I like moved around the country. I was in California for a while, I was in Massachusetts. Um, and then I got a job in Chapel Hill working for um, like a brewery, like working at, at a brewery, just like, cause I thought I wanted to be a brewer cause I had this background in biology, I was interested in business. Um, and then I like realized, I had this realization that I was like, okay, I have to do something that like creates more value. Um, and then I decided that I was gonna get a job at a lab and it took me probably three months to get a job at a lab. And I had like a very, um, at least when I was interviewing, everywhere I interviewed people were like, oh, this, uh, I felt like I had a pretty strong resume. Um, and it was still really challenging just because the way jobs are acquired is not, frequently they're not, people don't find candidates through like your Indeed posting, but they find candidates through social networks, like connections. And so I didn't have any networks um and like the industry that i wanted to get into and so i had to like build out those networks and inevitably actually got a job through the guy who was my realtor when i first moved here <laughs> like so it was like the network actually paid off in the end but it was like it was it was bizarre um and so what i would have I, maybe can i say what i would have done differently if i was of course yes of course okay what i would have done differently is i would have like one, I would have like stockpiled a little bit of cash before I graduated. Like I would have tried to like, I don't know, stockpiled like, I don't know, $2,000 probably or something like that, like a thousand to $2,000. And then I would have moved to the like area of the country that has the best, um, like is most optimized for the industry I wanted to be in. So for example, like um, if I wanted to get into tech, I would move to like, like Silicon Valley or San Francisco. If I wanted to move, get into like education, I might move to like Philadelphia. Uh, if I wanted to get into research, I might move to like Chapel Hill. Um, Chapel Hill is a great biotech scene. Um, if I wanted to get into international work, I might move to DC, et cetera, et cetera. And then I would have like tried to get a service job maybe there or something that would be like kind of straight off the line and try to just make connections, like just live up life a little bit, like go out to parties, not that you can right now, but hopefully next summer you'll be able to like go to parties, like make friends with people that are your peers and like leverage those relationships to get jobs. Um, I think that I like thought that I utilized that like indeed applying it like from a, a distance. Um, and that was like a really waste of time. Like I should have, I could have just like chilled 
and waited for like something to come through my network versus like like hustling every day to try to find a job through Indeed. It was not worth that. Um, so those are the things I would have changed, but that's what I did right after I graduated. Yeah. Thank you. I think I have time for one more question before I'm going to let, let uh, you guys ask some questions. Um, I wanted to ask you this, in my opinion, my, uh, very, very significant question for us. I mean, as Earlham grads, as well as, um, you know, students being current Earlham students, how has your Earlham experience impacted your professional journey so far? How do you think Earlham has impacted you and your life in general? Maybe you can talk about it from a personal perspective and a professional perspective, really, however you chose to, however you choose to do that. But talk a little bit about how Earlham influenced your life. Yeah. So maybe it'll be helpful if I just have a, some background would, was I grew up in Dayton, Ohio. So I grew up across, like right across the border and like a rural town of Dayton, Ohio. So I was like between two cornfields. Like I grew up in like a very rural town. Um, like all my friends from home never left Dayton. Um, they all are like in Dayton. And so I think coming to Earlham just like opened my eyes to that there was like a larger world out there. Like I think for me, I thought, I thought like I was gonna be like, like my biggest dream is like, I'm gonna go to like uh, university, Ohio State University and like, I'm going to like go into medicine and be like a doctor in like Cincinnati or something. Like that was like my whole scope, like that I had exposure to. And I think going to Earlham like gave me perspective that like the world is like a, a um, the world is like your oyster, right? And you can like do whatever you want. Like it's just like very, it's like everything's like a keystroke away pretty much. I think very much so is the where you can like figure out how to do most things and like whatever your wildest dreams are, someone's probably done it before you. And so like just Googling and trying to figure out what they can do, uh, what they do, or like meeting people that have done it, like from Earlham, your Earlham friends. Um, yeah, so I think that was like great. The exposure at Earlham will like totally open my eyes. Um, and then the other component I think that Earlham really taught, the other component that Earlham really taught me, and it wasn't like through my major that I learned this, but I think learning how to ask questions and think strategically is like a really important skill set that like like life is like even though it doesn't sound like this everyone's like people don't talk about it this much but it's like if you can figure out how to like manage yourself and like ask the right questions and like think and listen i think listening is a huge component of that um so questions like thinking like systematically and listening, those were all skills that I learned in philosophy classes and in like PAGS classes um, on campus. And um, those skills I use so much. Like I use those like, uh, I use those every day. Like that's like probably my, my core skill set. Um, and so I think like really building, that's a skill, right? And people think of it as like kind of an innate talent but like building out your skills, of like how am I listening? What am I, what am I thinking of? How am I asking the right follow-up questions? Like um, how am I, uh, those are the questions, then how am I then taking that and thinking about things strategically, like where I'm like mapping it out and like systematically going through a process. Um, that's the really high level stuff that like people don't really teach you uh, to like do. You kind of learn that um, by like, uh, by going through classes and I think the more you can practice that skill, the better you'll be. And I've seen that like across my friends who are more successful. They like are, they did a lot of like, um, they learned a lot about how to think versus directly how to like do skills. Um, Cause you can, mm -hmm. if you can learn how to think you can learn a skill very quickly. It's not hard to learn how to code or something like that um, or how to do sales. And so learning how to think and spending time thinking and writing down your thinking patterns and like frameworks for thinking Mm. Um, like documenting that is really valuable. So, thank you so much. I truly, truly appreciate it. I enjoyed this so much, guys. I'm gonna let you open the floor up for you uh, to ask some questions. So you can go ahead. I, I, I see. Well, Rance is here. Alice, Grace, um, Ebony. If you have any questions, Baby is still here. Um, go for it. Who, who, who's got a, who's got a first question? I'll go for it. Yeah, sure. Go for it. Uh, so uh, thanks uh, 
Thanks today. Thanks for coming. Uh, so I have a quick question. So what are uh, some key issues or problems you're dealing with in the business world today? Some key issues or problems I'm dealing with? Yes. Interesting. Um, can you be like more specific? Like, uh, like what, what are my business facing? Or like, what do you think? What do I think the business world is facing? Or yes, yes, in, uh, in your business. And uh, with, I mean, and what have businesses uh, done uh, with as COVID-19 has progressed as well? Interesting. Um, yeah, so like uh, socially, I think, well, like maybe like larger scale, obviously the market's like taking a downturn that like election is like throwing everything I think into like slight chaos. So like the reason like I think government functions well is like when it creates certainty, right? For people um, and like people feel like they are stable and safe and like, Right now, I think a lot of people don't feel stable and safe. And like that, um, and a lot of people are like, there's a lot of people that are like kind of coming to the service where they haven't felt stable and safe for a long time and that's being acknowledged. And I think that is like, um, yeah, that's I think probably from like a uncertainty from a business world perspective, there's lots of uncertainty. COVID is like throwing a lot of like retail businesses into turmoil. I think that like simultaneously as things evolve, there's a lot of new opportunities. Um, so, Interesting, like some interesting businesses to check out would be like Talk. Um, they are like a restaurant delivery service. They like helped. Um, they're like a like a software subscription that helps um, restaurants like run their own delivery. Um, so there's like interesting businesses that are popping up out of this, and we're pivoting in the same sense too. Like we're there's new markets being opened because there's change. So that's valuable, I think. Um, but just interesting, right? I think the the environment in general like the business environment is really evolving with covid um, and they're trying to kind of get stability there um, from an internal perspective so from like the young founders institute and thinking about what we're doing i think we're trying to adapt to that as well i think we're like at this point where we have a business like it runs efficiently like uh, in the end, you're trying to build like a process that like can be repeated. And the YFI is like a, has built a repeatable process. Um, and that's like exciting. And now we're thinking about now, how do we scale this repeatable process? Like, are we going to, and do we think this particular repeatable process is scalable? So something like some of the issues that we're encountering is like, um, it's very hard to scale a service business that's labor-based. It's hard to scale, like, for example, like a tutoring business that like requires tutors, it's hard to scale while like a software business, right? That is the marginal cost of an additional customer is like 10 cents for like a $10,000 product because it's just server space. Um, that there's a, a scaling issue. There's like, it's much easier to scale that than to scale like something where you need a new tutor every time you're gonna like teach a lesson. And so that's one of the things that like our business is like kind of juggling is like, how do we add tech to scale what we're currently doing. Thank you. Does that answer your question a little bit, Rance? Yes, thanks, Well, yeah. Cool. Well, who wants to ask another question? I have a quick question, um, and then I will have to head out because I have class. Um, but I'm curious what it sounds like you do a lot of behind the scenes uh, business work um, and you're not like hands on with the kids. Uh, but do you uh, are there parts of your company that um, is hands on with those kids and and how is that working? Yeah, I do. So I actually do a ton of hands on work with the, the students, too. Oh, okay. um, I like yeah, I like love mentoring. I love working with teens. I've been doing it for I worked for Outward Bound previously and uh, other like, I've been mentoring teams for a long time. So I, I do that as well. I think that we do, yeah, we predominantly are like a, we provide teens mentorship, but there's tons of kids that want to start businesses and like we help them think through it like effectively and like build out, we give them like that process, right? Um, and so we, yeah, I'm constantly, I think I just, while we were in this meeting, I got pinged by four different students to like set up calls or asking questions about things. So. Um, we really work closely with the students and like that also allows us to build something that solves their problems more efficiently, so, yeah. Cool, thank you so much. I'm gonna head out. It was very nice meeting you, Will, and good seeing you. For sure, take care, Grace. Thanks, Grace.
Hey, Will, were you inside the uh, Venture for America Fellowship? Yeah. How did you, uh, could you talk a little bit about that experience? Yeah, totally. So I went through, so after I graduated, I didn't even know BFA was out there. Um, and then it like came across my radar, must have been two years ago. Um, and I applied one time for BFA. And the first time I applied, I didn't get accepted into BFA. And then the second time I applied, it was like really easy for me to get accepted. So just as a note, it's easy to come back the second time and get accepted to VFA. Like if you go twice, um, the VFA is interesting. They give you, a, you get a job at a, in a city, like in a developing city um, at a startup. Um, and so I got into VFA and then when, when it came time to get a job in a developing city, my org like YFI was starting to get a lot of traction. Um, and so I actually didn't go through VFA's program. It was just the, um, we went through like the training component of it, which was I think really like valuable. And then I've like worked with them kind of going forward to like support them. But I think VFA is like a really awesome opportunity for students to learn about entrepreneurship and learn about, get exposure to startups. Like I think, Working at a startup is a great way to understand the processes that entrepreneurs go through, especially when you're working at something small and like apprentice with an entrepreneur. Um, and so we try to like actually cultivate that same process at YFI. We call it the entrepreneur program. Um, but it's very, uh, I think it's definitely valuable. It's definitely a worthwhile pursuit to intern or to apprentice with an entrepreneur in whatever field you're interested in. What, do you have any specific questions about it, Rance? Are you thinking about applying? Oh uh, yes, uh, I'm, I'm I'm in the process of applying right now. So yeah, uh, I just gotta wait till next round. So uh, yeah, I think I have like a, I can refer you if you want. Like I have, um, I can give you a. Okay. <laughs> you can get, use my name if you want, and I can connect you with some VFA fellows. A lot of my friends went to the VFA program. Okay, cool. Yeah, thanks. That'd be awesome. Yeah, thanks so much. For sure. Will, maybe you want to leave your contact info or anything in here in the chat. Yeah, so I'll drop it in the chat right now. Yeah. Any other questions, guys? Hey, Will, could you talk a little bit about uh, the importance of a liberal arts degree inside the world, uh, the business world today? Yeah, that's a great question. Okay, so I think the, how do you, there's a question of like, how do you leverage your degree, right? Like, um, where I think people go wrong is that like someone will understand the value of your degree on the surface. Does that make sense? Like your degree is valuable in that you can apply it in a way that allows you to be more proficient and then like rise. It's like, it's easy once you're in the system to apply your skill sets and like climb through the ranks very efficiently with liberal arts degree. And I think that's, very valuable and it's really interesting a lot of the people that i know that are like execs or like leading startups they all had a liberal arts background and they think um critically and creatively versus someone who's like um yeah I, maybe i won't even give it like a comparison but i think that like someone who a lot of liberal arts folks do really well in organizations or do well in entrepreneurial capacities but I think you have to figure out how do you get there, right? How do you get to that entrepreneurial opportunity? Um, so is that learning a skill? Like, is that like learning a skill that you're really good at that's a highly valuable skill? So like tech or sales, or is it um, getting part, being part of a network of people um, that will help you get access to the jobs that you want, that where you can apply your knowledge. So like a product manager or, um, and I like, I think that like the risk there is like getting, trying to, when you're applying for jobs that are, you're competing against people that don't have liberal arts degrees and that are really just like technical. Like there's like a lot of jobs in the world that are like, how can I move one rock from here to here? Like, and you do that all day long. Like that's what I was doing in a lab. Like I was just moving, I was like a construction worker, but with, on a micro scale, like it was not, um, there was not like a lot of, thought that was involved in my role. Um, it was pretty basic. And I think that like, 
if you're in that position, like it might be harder for you to shine in that direction, if that makes sense. Um, because you're just building, you're just kind of executing the process over and over again. And so figuring out what, how do you circumvent those roles by either having really valuable experience. So when I think value comes through tech or sales predominantly, um, or how do you leverage like a network of people or like connections to get into that roles where you can uh, be more thoughtful and innovative and really drive value? Um, does that kind of help a little bit, Rance, like with what you're thinking about? What, what do you, how does that resonate with you? I know it's like kind of like a totally different way of thinking about it and it's kind of abstract, but what do you all think of that process or that thought process? Oh, you're muted, Rance. Okay, yeah. I mean, so uh, in, my, in my thought process, uh, I mean, I just think that in the business world today, a liberal arts degree is uh, important as uh, <clears throat> as individuals need to learn. Uh, as I think a liberal arts degree prepares you to uh, uh, understand and uh, learn how to solve uh, key key problems that are uh, taking place throughout our world. And so I think uh, as, I mean, as my time at Earlham has, uh, helped me uh, uh, find out solutions inside the real world today. Yeah, totally, totally, yeah. There's some more like strategic like insights. And if you guys wanna talk more about like, strate like strategy for how to like apply your liberal arts degree, feel free to ping me, but um, you can shoot me an email and we can set up another time to talk. But I think the, I think a lot about that, like how do you best leverage your skills that you have? Um, because it's not, there's not like a beaten path for how to get a liberal arts degree. Like once you have a liberal arts degree, like the beaten path is like someone who like has a deep technical knowledge and how they get in. But someone who has like a more like uh, broad, but like thought oriented knowledge, it's a different methodology for actually acquiring a job and getting into a profession. Um, and so I'd be more than happy to chat with you about how to do that and just like, how to construct your thinking around it. Wait, my connection is a little bit unstable. I keep getting these messages saying connection unstable. <laughs> Wanted to make sure you guys still hear me. We can hear you, yep. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for this. I wanted to ask one more time if you guys have any other kind of questions. Um, I know we'll, I know we'll drop his email address in here, but do you have any more questions that he could address now? We still have a few minutes left. I don't know if you have class or not, but if you guys do, just let me know. Um, I know well, some. It's good to see you again. It's Ebony. Um, Hi, Ebony. Uh, things are crazy over here, so my video is off. However, are you active on LinkedIn? I am, yeah. Great, great, great. And how does, does LinkedIn play any role or what type of role does LinkedIn play in your professional life today? That's a great question. Um, I use LinkedIn to, I use LinkedIn to like kind of research people. So when I think about like job seeking or like my professional development, I think about it through the lens of role models. So I try to pick a role model. Like, so for example, Someone who's a role model of mine is someone named Ben Gilbert. Um, he's 30, he runs a startup studio based out of uh, Seattle, Washington. Um, and he was, um, CBB. Um, and the, so anyways, I use LinkedIn to track other people, how they got to where they were. So I think about like, where did they start? Um, and so I, I like to use LinkedIn to like kind of see someone's like career trajectory and then think about, okay, like where do I fit? Like, how could I map my story to match theirs or um, understand kind of where they're headed? I sometimes use it for like sales a little bit from time to time, but I don't use it that, I use it very much for just like finding role models, I think, and like trying to match those pattern matching like through my day-to-day -day life. I see. I have one more question. Sure. What would students trying to follow a similar trajectory to yours, what should they be taking advantage of right now as an Earlham student? I think you touched on this a little bit earlier, but like reemphasizing that, what can they do right now? Yeah, I think um, what's like, 
I would get, um, what would be like the first thing I would do? I would like really try to start a company while you're an undergrad. Like, I know you think that like, it, it sounds like a big undertaking, um, but I would just start even like the smallest business possible. Like if you're like, for example, like I was just listening to a podcast uh, and there's a guy who is like, he's talking to these venture capitalists about his like the podcast of these venture capitalists interviewing like startup founders. And he references a company that he started where he sold these little copters that he bought on Alibaba for three cents and was selling them for four dollars. Okay, like that is though, even that's like that little business sense that you'll start to get from that will really give you insights into any profession. And so like just selling anything, like building something, selling it, making t-shirts, whatever it is, just thinking about how like to create value in the world that skill, you can then leverage that into any job because what is an employer looking for, right? They want to hire someone who can create value. And if you're like, oh, I know how to create value, like that's music to an employer's ears. Um, Cause then they can say like, okay, like you go do that. <laughs> we'll like step back and I don't have to work as much, right? Um, and so I would really encourage you to like start thinking about like, what is like a little thing I could solve? It doesn't have to be like, don't try to solve like climate change. That's like, or like um, something like create, like really impactful. Just find something really small that you just cut off and solve that one problem. Um, uh, maybe it's like baking bread and delivering it to your friend's houses, like something very easy, right? Or buying meat in bulk and selling it to your friends. Like those would be, those are totally great businesses and like can teach you a lot about how the world works and create some independence that, um, will allow you to feel really empowered when you actually get into the market and are trying to find a job. Thank you. Thank you, that was really good. Rance, Alice, do you have any more questions? Well, Rance, are you good? Okay, well, well we're almost at time um i want to thank you for joining us today thank you for working with us you and i will follow up more on you know the internship opportunities that the yfi is um looking to um, recruit early students for in the future if you guys by the way if you're interested um you can contact me and i will get you the right info but the yfi is looking to partner up with Earlham and potentially recruit Earlham students for internships moving forward um, so yeah, let us know if you have any questions. Will, do you have any questions for us? No, I don't think so. I can give a quick plug for the internship program if that's helpful. Sure. Um, so the internship program is around this idea of being an entrepreneur. Um, so like you can be an entrepreneur, which is like an exterior thing where you're going out to the market and um, kind of building your own company. But an entrepreneur is where you start with an idea within a company and then you build that into an organization. So or it's like a product line. We would call that like a product line or a department, right? Um, and so we're, we have an entrepreneur program at YFI and Zoya is actually part of that entrepreneur program um, where we bring in um, recent college grads or undergrads to build out a product. And along the way they're learning, um, learning from our team and you're learning entrepreneurship as well as like being part of a community of uh, talented entrepreneurs. Um, and so that is something that we really want to extend to Earlham folks. I think that like Earlham has a great group of like students who are excited about this type of stuff. And so if you guys are interested in more in that, feel free to shoot me a message. Um, this could be during the year or over the summer. Um, and yeah, I think it'll be awesome to work with any of you going forward. So yeah, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. Wish you a good rest of the week. All of you guys have a great week and let's uh, let's get our tasks completed. Let's not procrastinate too much. <laughs> let's be efficient and effective and productive. And most importantly though, let's take care of our mental health. Um, and we'll see you later.